faith that endures. When experiencing unexplainable trials and sufferings, we should draw inner strength from Job's incredible faith. Here now is Gene Getz. I've got to be honest with you. The more that I read about the response of these three men, the more disturbed I get. I could get very angry at them. Just as I'm reading how they're reacting, then I have to realize God has recorded this for us to learn. Uh, to learn to apply in our own lives principles that are demonstrated out of a negative kind of situation. Sometimes our greatest lessons can come from the way people misbehave. And uh, Paul made that clear when he wrote the Corinthians, said all these things are written down that you might learn. And the things that are written down, he's referring to, is their evil ways, dealing with the children of Israel. So we can learn positive things. Well, listen to what Eliphaz had to say in his third speech. And here he gets just as insensitive. He says to Job, Come to terms with God and be at peace. You want to say, you know, if you're listening at all, Eliphaz, what do you think Job is trying to do in this horrible situation? He's not listening. He says, come to terms with God and be at peace. In this way, good will come to you. Receive instruction from His mouth. Place His sayings in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be renewed. If you banish injustice. Now, underscore that. He's, in, he's accusing Job of injustice. And yet, by contrast, God has said... And of course, these three guys didn't hear this, but they had observation, but God verified it when He said to Satan, Consider my servant Job. He's an upright man. He's a man of integrity. He's a man who fears me. He's not a man of injustice. And so here, Eliphaz is accusing him of being unjust and how he's behaving. If you banish injustice from your tent, then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. In other words, what he is saying here is just the opposite of what God has said about this man, Job. Now, Job responded. And I, I must admit, as you read through this, it seems a bit jumbled, but the fact of the matter is, it's the essence of his heart. And even though he couldn't find God, God seemed to be silent, he still didn't lose his faith. Notice what he says. This is Job speaking. If I go east, he's not there. If I go west, I cannot perceive him. When he's at work to the north, I cannot see him. When he turns south, I cannot find him. Wow. Those are statements of an incredible, painful experience. He is not there. I cannot perceive Him. I cannot see Him. I cannot find Him. Yet, and get this, yet He knows the way I've taken. When He has tested me, I will emerge as pure gold. My feet have followed in His tracks. I have kept to His way. That sounds like Paul, doesn't it? I sometimes wonder if Paul wasn't thinking of this passage when he wrote that second letter to Timothy and said, I have finished the course. I have fought the good fight. Here, Job says, I have kept to his way. I have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily food. What an incredible statement, even though God appears to be absolutely silent and non-existent. Look at Job's faith. Here in verses 16 and 17 in chapter 23. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not destroyed by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. He didn't give up his faith in God. And as we've seen 
throughout this study, we've made reference to it, but during the first century particularly, if you read the New Testament and if you read church history at all, particularly during the time of the Reformation, there were many Christians who faced horrible persecution from their enemies and the During the Reformation time, it was actually those who claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ who persecuted other Christians because they took issues with the horrible abuses of the church, particularly the Roman church. They were burned at the stake because they even tried to translate the Bible so people could read it. They suffered. When Peter wrote his first letter, he was in Rome. He was in the same predicament as Paul was, no doubt. And he was being persecuted. And Nero was going crazy with his attitude towards Christians. And other Christians were facing the same problems throughout the Roman Empire. Listen to Peter's words. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold which perishes, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, you wonder if Peter wasn't thinking about the book of Job. And the very thing that Job said about being tried by fire and coming forth as gold. Here's a question for application. When ministering to hurting people, how can we discern the appropriate time to share these biblical truths? From 1 Peter... And we could say also from James, because James says some wonderful things about going through trials, knowing that the testing of our faith will produce endurance and God will do His complete work in us. When can we discern when to speak and what to speak? Well, let me give you a couple of suggestions at least that have come to me in my own experience, and that is that We can speak when the person asks for reassurance. Boy, that's a real open door. When a person said, I need need a word of encouragement from the Lord. That's an open door that we need to walk through. How many times I've read Psalm 23 in situations like that. Or when the person... Uh, will share these truths themselves where people begin to talk about their pain and that they're Christians and they don't understand it, but they have faith in the Lord. That's an open door to walk through that door. And the fact is that we can share even when a person is unconscious. I've done that a number of times over the years when people are on their deathbed or they're in a coma. And the amazing thing is, when you open the Scriptures and you begin to read the Word of God, sometimes there are responses. You can see it in the eyelids. You can almost sense there's comprehension. We don't know what's going on in their hearts. I've even shared that with people that we don't know whether or not they know the Lord, and you share the gospel with them, even in that that state. So we need to look for these opportunities that God is is giving to us in relationship to communicating with people in these very difficult times. I've been doing a lot of research late, lately on Martin Luther. And Martin Luther went through some horrible experiences trying to find God in terms of going into a situation where he literally uh, denied him things, himself things that God normally says we need. They say that Because of his denial in the monastery, uh, refusing uh, certain foods and things, and refusing even to um, cover himself at night, he was trying to somehow do away with his sins and draw near to God. But then when he came to an understanding that that doesn't get you close to God, and he began to teach salvation by grace through faith, he was criticized. His life was threatened, uh, literally threatened. Uh, people threatened to kill him. He was banned uh, by, the, by the state government, literally. And people were given the freedom to take his life. And he had to hide away uh, in order to, um, to really uh, be safe. And by the way, 
he was in a castle hidden away. And it's an amazing thing while he was in that castle in spite of all his pain. And I actually saw the desk at which he sat and, and translated the whole New Testament. And he did that in just several months. Plus he wrote 12 books during that 10-month period. In spite of all of that, he went through persecution. And in the end of his life, he went through horrible illnesses. He had all kinds of problems physically, which they say relate back to some of the things that he did in trying to get near to God when he was in a monastery and denying himself of certain things that his body needed. And yet, at the end of his life, when he was dying, one of his friends said, Martin, after all this, do you still believe? And his final words in German, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 